right now on Jewish Voice with Jonathan Bernis. And I began to feel complete, why am I doing this? Why am I learning this strange language? Why am I reading these stories in a Bible if the Bible isn't true? It just seemed ridiculous. Shalom and welcome to Jewish Voice, where we help you to discover the Jewish roots of your Christian faith. I'm Jonathan Bernis. Thanks for joining us. We have a special guest host for you today, Shay Wilbur. She's the daughter-in-law of Messianic musician Paul Wilbur, and she's a former American Idol contestant and an entertainment reporter working in Hollywood, and I've known her since she was a baby. Recently, Shay interviewed best-selling novelist Andrew Claven, who grew up in a secular Jewish home and then came to faith in Yeshua in an amazing way. Here's some background on him. Andrew Claven grew up a secular Jew in New York. He became an award-winning mystery writer in Hollywood, where directors like Clint Eastwood turned his novels into blockbuster films. His biggest triumph was coming to faith in Yeshua 10 years ago. Still a working writer, Andrew and his wife Ellen live in Los Angeles. Writers of America Edgar Awards, please welcome author Andrew Claven. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. I'm delighted to be here. We're both from LA. We made the trip. We did. And I have to say, I am kind of having a fangirl moment. I'm such a fan of your work. Oh, thank you. And I'm just so honored that you're here with us today and that we get to kind of share your story thank with you the very world. Much. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's, it's so good to have you here. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, you grew up in a semi-observant Jewish household, kind of? Kind of, ish. yeah. Was, I mean, it's, it was stranger than that, you know? I mean, it was a little, it was a, it was a weird upbringing. My, my father was a very popular New York City DJ, which is a big market, so he was, yeah. a, you know, a big guy in that field. It was important to him that me and my three brothers were raised in the Jewish tradition. So we went to Hebrew school and we had the high holidays. But the thing that kind of was discordant for me was that neither of my parents really believed in God. You know, my mother, my mother yeah. was a stone atheist till the day she died. I mean, I've never met a more convicted atheist wow. in my life. She just thought the whole thing was ridiculous. It was kind of a little bit anti-Semitic. She was Jewish, but she kind of wanted to, How you know, that work? she didn't like the whole Etho, the kind of old world mm -hmm. ethos of it. She wanted to what be was associated with being Jewish. Yeah, she wanted to be like the movie star she had seen growing up, a kind of elegant yeah. Ginger Rogers type of person. Okay. Uh, and my father was more of an anti. You know, he he kind of hedged his bets. I wouldn't say he was an atheist. He was he was he didn't want like some gigantic invisible Jew to give him cancer, <laughs> you know, in the sky. But but he really didn't believe. We didn't say grace. We didn't go talk about God. Right. We didn't. You know. And so it all began to seem very empty to me. I mean, here you have this beautiful 4,000-year-old tra Jewish tradition, yeah. and I began to feel complete, why am I doing this? Why am I learning this strange language? Why am I reading these stories in a Bible if the Bible isn't true? It just seemed ridiculous. So by the time I was bar mitzvahed, I didn't want to do it. I just thought, this is complete hypocrisy. And I, you know, my father insisted that I go through with it, and I kind of went through with it. And in that area and in that time, they gave you a lot of guilt for your bar mitzvah. I got a lot of jewelry, a lot of, a lot, money, a lot of money, bonds. For those who don't know what guilt is. Yeah, exactly. A lot of gifts. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of good stuff. And I, I put them all in this leather box. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was 13. It was the first time I'd ever had any kind of wealth at yeah. all. And I would stare kind of like, you know, I thought, wow, this what is great. What do I do with this? Uh, yeah. And after about six months, I began to feel bad. You know, mm -hmm. I began to feel that I had sold my integrity, which is a, kind of a big thought wow. for a 13-year-old kid. Yeah. And one day, everybody went to bed early in my house because my father had an early morning show. And one day, I waited until everybody was asleep. And I crept out in the middle of the night. And I left the house. And I went out to the garbage cans we had. And I took this box full of thousands of dollars worth of jewelry and savings bonds. And, and I stuffed it in the garbage so nobody would see it. And they came and took it away. And that was supposed to be the end of my religious life. Yeah. It was almost like you knew the weight you didn't want to be associated with something unless you were sincerely connected to it. That's it. And you yeah. didn't want to kind of be placed in that hypocritical place. But it seems like it was something that was at your father's urging. 
Um, Very much so, so. were you close with your father? No, no, we had a really bad relationship. <laughs> I, you know, my, uh, I, I always hate to talk about this in one way because my father was a decent guy. Yeah. He had integrity. He was lovely to my mother. They had a great marriage. Yeah. My, I learned so much. My lovely marriage is uh, inspired by the mm -hmm. way he treated her and all this. But he just didn't take to me. There was something we were oil and water. Hmm. I was probably a little stubborn. I had a very different worldview than he did. And he was always, always on me, always trying to foil any plans I had, always running me down. You know, he was a comedian. So even though he, he would hit me and, and make fun of me in a way he never did my brothers, then it really made me a divided soul because when mm -hmm. you're at odds with your dad, what really happens is at the same time you're fighting with him, you're fighting with yourself because he's part of yeah. your worldview. You know? so, your own identity. Yeah. So what happened, um, you know, after your bar mitzvah, you throw everything in, right. in the trash. What happened from that point? Like, what was your next step in your spiritual journey, so well, to speak? The, the first thing was, is I wanted so badly to be a writer. Mm -hmm. And I loved the tough guy writers. I loved Raymond Chandler, yeah. the detective writers, Ernest Hemingway. And I started to notice that every book that I loved had an element of quest in it. And they all yeah. related back to the King Arthur myths. And so I started to read the King Arthur myths. And then I saw that all the King Arthur myths were connected to Christianity. Yeah. And here I am being raised in a Jewish household in a Jewish neighborhood. I didn't know anything about Christianity. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, I better find out about this purely as literature. Yeah. So I went out, we didn't have a New Testament in the house, when I went out and bought one of those hotel books, you know, with the words with, of Jesus in red right, and red right. and stuff. And you're like, okay, I'm gonna pay attention to the red. I've never <laughs> seen this before. <laughs> I thought this is new. <laughs> so, and I started with the, uh, the Gospel according to Luke mm -hmm. because, now I'm 15 years old, I started with the Gospel according to Luke because I, I thought the Christmas story is in there and I heard the Christmas story. This is pretty remarkable. This is happening when you're 15. This sounds like the journey of someone who's like, you know, 30s, 25s. No, 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 I was very dedicated continue. to this is amazing. To, and so I'm in my bedroom, which was on the ground floor, and I'm reading the Gospel according to Luke. And my father, who loved to interrupt me, whatever I was doing, because he didn't want me to, yeah. like he'd hear me writing and he'd come in and bother me and all this stuff. He burst in at dinner time and he finds me reading the Gospel according to Luke. Now think about this for a second, because yeah. I was a 15 year old boy, right? And it's the 60s, so he could have found me reading, you know, you walking Any, on your 15 year old son, you're yeah. gonna find him reading something really, but he found me reading the wow. gospel according to Luke and he was furious. I mean, this was bringing the enemy into the house. These were the okay. evil Christians who hated Jews and had spread all this anti-Semitism. And here he was, I bar mitzvahed you. Uh, you should have been going in the right direction and now you're reading the New Testament. And he went off on me. Wow. And of course, I was reading it really as literature. I had no concept of it as faith. And he went off on me, I mean, foul language coming out and all this yeah. stuff. And he finally put his finger an inch from my nose and he said, if you ever think of converting, I'll disown you. Okay, so we have to take a break, but when we come back, we're gonna hear more from Andrew, how you went from being a 15-year-old boy reading the New Testament in secret to the incredible journey that you've had to today. That's next. <laughs> I can see that God was using this, this Christian character to send me a non-Christian message because I wouldn't have listened. Do you struggle with questions about God's love for you? Do doubts creep into your faith? Are down moods and anxiety part of your life? Then you need The Great Good Thing by international best-selling author Andrew Clavin. Clavin's award-winning writing style makes this a book you won't want to put down. Hollywood directors like Clint Eastwood turn Clavin's novels into blockbuster films, but it's this story of God's miraculous intervention that'll have you on the edge of your seat. Journey along with Andrew Clavin's quest for answers. Find out what changed Clavin from an agnostic Jew to a committed Jesus follower. Learn how his depression and anxiety was replaced with a deep confidence in God's love. This true life tale will amaze and encourage. Read Clavin's miraculous story to deepen your walk with God. Then pass the book on to someone who doesn't know the love of God and watch their life change. Order The Great Good Thing by Andrew Clavin now. When you order this important book from us today, we'll also send you this stunning mezuzah. The elegant pewter color is complemented by the grafted in symbol to remind you that you are adopted into the family of Jesus, the Messiah. Inside is a tiny scroll of Deuteronomy 6. Hang this mezuzah on your doorway as a reminder to pray for peace in Jerusalem and be blessed. We'll send you both of these great resources for your donation of $39. Remember, God said he will bless those who bless the Jewish people. 
these lost Jewish tribes are not forgotten to God. And God says when you bless them, he will bless you. So call the number on your screen now and consider becoming a monthly partner to bless scattered Jewish tribes like these around the world. You can also click or write with your gift of support by going to our website, jvmi.tv, or writing to us at Jewish Voice, Post Office Box 6, Phoenix, Arizona, 85001. Please specify offer 1855 when giving $39 or more to receive your gifts. Call, click, or write today. We're here talking to award-winning writer Andrew Clavin about his book, The Great Good Thing. So let's pick up where we left off. Um, kind of bring me through the next few steps of your life. One of the events of central importance happened to me, which was not going to school. It was, it was meeting my wife. Two weeks later, three weeks maybe, we were living in sin. Four, four years <laughs> later, we got married. We've been married for 40 years. We've had two children. And we've had one argument in our life. Wow. One. I mean, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, we had an argument. It has been a romance, okay? So this was an important thing because because at the same time this was happening, I was beginning to unravel. Mm -hmm. I had a very difficult, I had this thing in my mind, this recurring depression. It could be, it could be so bad that I would just kind of curl up in my bed and yeah. sit there. And it would come back around and it would come back with this terrible, terrible anger. And the anger would direct itself against whoever was there. So right. my wife was, was there a lot of the time. And I, I couldn't, I wanted so much to be a writer and I couldn't get my career started. And I was just furious. And it really did push me to the point, I, was, I went nuts. I went yeah. nuts. I started to have delusions, delusions of grandeur. I started wow. to, because I realized, I had realized by that time that Jesus was at the center of Western culture. You know, is at the center of Western literature. Yeah. So I started to like write about him and think about him, but not with any faith whatsoever. I, so I start, interesting. And I started to get him confused with me. I started to think, well, maybe I'm like a kind of a savior. Messiah kind of, complex yes, or I, oh, I was, I was really yeah. out of my mind. But all the while, I was crazy about my wife. I was in love with my wife, <laughs> really in love yeah. with her. And so even though there, I, she would go out and I would conceive this rage against her and think, oh, she's betraying me in some way. Not, not necessarily with another guy, but just, you yeah, know, just plotting against me. And I would start to think I'm going to really give it to her when mm -hmm. she would get home. But every time she'd walk in the door, reality would hit me again. And I would think, this is nuts. This yeah. is nuts because I loved her so much. And ultimately, I, I turned to her and it finally, finally occurred to me that I was going mad. I thought, I thought this was just life. I thought that this is what it was going to be like I for you. I thought when you're an intellectual, yeah. when you're an artist, you're miserable. That's in all the books and all this stuff. And finally I turned to her and I said, I, I need help. I'm something I've cracked. And she helped me get a psychiatrist and uh, the guy changed my life. Wow. And it, you know, it's funny. I, when I look back, when I wrote this book, this is one of the weirdest things. I wrote this book about 10 years, started about 10 years after I was baptized. And when I wrote the story, suddenly I realized that Jesus was standing in places all the time. And, and throughout of, your life. Throughout my life. Yeah. And I'd never, not only had I not seen him then, but I hadn't seen him until I wrote the story down yeah. and could see it in the page. And one of the ways was in this moment, my lowest moment, when I really thought I was, I started to think about killing myself. And at this point, I, I had a daughter, you know, she was one or two years old. Yeah. Uh, and I was living in New York and my career still wasn't going well and I was starting to come out of the craziness but I was that depressed and I was sitting in a room by myself drinking and smoking and listening to a baseball game and thinking about how I was going to go upstairs and walk off the top of the building wow. and a Christian ball player named Gary Carter the catcher for the Mets was interviewed after the game because he had run out a, a single even though he had bad knees and the interviewer said to him how can you run so fast when your knees are gone? And usually Carter would go like, oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Yeah. And I hated that. I would never have listened. But you this time, out immediately. Yeah, this time he didn't do that. He just said, you know, sometimes you have to play in pain. Wow. And I remember hearing that and thinking, I can do that. I can play wow. in pain. And it kept me alive. It kept me alive. <clears throat> and when I look back, I can see that God was using this, this Christian character to send me a non-Christian message because I wouldn't have listened. 
if it was masked if in name. And that to me is part of the majesty of God, that he's so humble that he doesn't care if you hear his name mm -hmm. as long as you hear his word. Yeah. He knew specifically what you needed yeah. in your life in that moment. It was an amazing moment, yeah. And so you had written two novels about Jesus, uh, or you have written at this point two novels about Jesus. Was that kind of your excuse to study him without having to say, I'm interested in, in this Jesus thing, right? It was, interested it was in a way of explaining him away. Got it. Because there was nothing that I loved that didn't have Jesus at the core of it. I love literature. I love Shakespeare. I love yeah. I, I loved all the great writing. I love all the great thinkers, the philosophers, and all of them, even the guys who rejected Christ, had to deal with him. Yeah. So I just wanted to explain him away. I wanted to show his psychology. Right. Right. I wanted to show why people were foolish enough to believe in him. I was really at war with him in a, in a certain way. So it was, it was kind of the opposite. It was your effort to disprove Jesus. To disprove You're like, him, I'm yeah. going to write these books. I'm going to study it so I can write to, it off. To and... humanize him and to make him less than myself. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. So when we come back, we're going to hear how Andrew finally surrendered to the truth. I was born a Jew, I was a secular guy for most of my yeah. life. I was as far away from faith as you could possibly get. Do you struggle with questions about God's love for you? Do doubts creep into your faith? Are down moods and anxiety part of your life? Then you need The Great Good Thing by international best-selling author Andrew Clavin. Clavin's award-winning writing style makes this a book you won't want to put down. Hollywood directors like Clint Eastwood turn Clavin's novels into blockbuster films. But it's this story of God's miraculous intervention that'll have you on the edge of your seat. Journey along with Andrew Clavin's quest for answers. Find out what changed Clavin from an agnostic Jew to a committed Jesus follower. Learn how his depression and anxiety was replaced with a deep confidence in God's love. This true life tale will amaze and encourage. Read Clavin's miraculous story to deepen your walk with God. Then pass the book on to someone who doesn't know the love of God and watch their life change. Order The Great Good Thing by Andrew Clavin now. When you order this important book from us today, we'll also send you this stunning mezuzah. The elegant pewter color is complemented by the grafted in symbol to remind you that you are adopted into the family of Jesus, the Messiah. Inside is a tiny scroll of Deuteronomy 6. Hang this mezuzah on your doorway as a reminder to pray for peace in Jerusalem and be blessed. We'll send you both of these great resources for your donation of $39. Remember, God said he will bless those who bless the Jewish people. These lost Jewish tribes are not forgotten to God. And God says when you bless them, he will bless you. So call the number on your screen now and consider becoming a monthly partner to bless scattered Jewish tribes like these around the world. You can also click or write with your gift of support by going to our website, jvmi.tv, or writing to us at Jewish Voice, Post Office Box 6, Phoenix, Arizona, 85001. Please specify offer 1855 when giving $39 or more to receive your gifts. Call, click, or write today. I'm Douglas Cutler, a physician, and this is my wife, Julie, a dentist. We've traveled with Jewish Voice on multiple medical outreaches to the other side of the world. Words cannot describe the horrific human sufferings we've seen. <laughs> the weak and feeble people walk for miles, sometimes even carrying others who are also sick to see one of our doctors to get treatment. The blind, the lame, and many others near death are a few common examples of the people that come to us for healing. It's almost overwhelming to see the sheer numbers, thousands of desperately sick and hurting villagers that have no hope unless people like you help. These are the lost tribes of Israel, the persecuted, the destitute, the least of these. You can be their lifeline. You can help us bring desperately needed medical care to them. Most importantly, you can help bring the life-changing message that Yeshua, their Messiah, has come. So 
we are back with Andrew. I want to know, when you sat down to write The Great Good Thing, how was your writing process different? Because you've written, I mean, books that many of us may know of, movies have been made based off of them. Michael Douglas was in one, Clint Eastwood in another. So you've written these like psychological thrillers. This is quite different but, yes. in a way uh, from those. So how was your writing process different when you sat down to write this? Well, the only thing that was really different, I mean, first of all, it was harder to rely. I rely in, a, in thrillers very strongly on outlines, so it was harder to do that. Yeah. The only thing that was really different, it was hard to know what to leave out. Uh, after a while, you become pretty expert on leaving stuff out because you've done it a lot and you get practice. Yeah. But with a real story, you don't want to leave out anything. When I handed the manuscript to my wife, uh, Ellen, who's always my first uh, editor, uh, she read it. It was, it was twice as long. And she read it and she said to me, half of this is the best book you ever wrote. That's amazing. So you're talking about cutting 200 pages yeah. that you've slaved over. And I said to her, you know, I don't think my ego is small enough to cut that much. Here's a pen. You do it. But you know? sometimes it's hard when it has to do with yourself, <laughs> yes. too. You need that outside That's perspective. Right. Yeah, it, it's, it is true. And she um, she worked on it for two weeks and edited it down. Wow. And then I rewrote it according to those specifications, just things that didn't need to be there. What was your was your goal just to tell your story when you sat down to write that? Was it? No. I, you know, I, my, the only reason I told it at all, it would yeah. never have occurred to me to tell my own story, except it occurred to me that, like, just about everybody is essentially living in the world I knew. I worked in Hollywood. I worked in New York. Yeah. I worked in London for a while. I was born a Jew. I was a secular guy for most of my yeah. life. I was as far away from faith as you could possibly get. And it occurred to me that that's where everybody lives. Everybody lives in a world where the default setting is secular. The yeah. All the music, all the TV you see, everything that comes into your mind. And in New York and L.A. especially, as you know, if you're a believer, there's something weird about you. You're not one of us, you know. You're from another. You're yeah. kind of. You're kind of a dope. You're kind of a yokel. And so I like just wanted to say. I just wanted to say, you know, even from that far away, mm -hmm. you can find your way home. You know. And I wanted to Amazing. tell that story in case there were people who just couldn't get past the hump of of the narrative that's being told. Yeah, you, you know? exactly. Yeah. It's uh, such an incredible story. Had your wife come, when, or when did your wife come to Jesus, or has she, what, it, my, what was my that wife, like? My wife found God when her mother died in her arms after a long wow. illness. Uh, she came back and she said to me, she, she always kind of wanted to believe, but she just mm -hmm. couldn't. And she came back and she said to me, I saw her go, I saw her go. And from that point, she began to realize there was another level of the world wow. that she hadn't dealt with, and it really changed her. Was that before or after you? It was. It was after I had come to faith in God, but before I had recognized Christ. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, there's. I could just ask you questions for days, but I, I'm so interested to know because you do work in Hollywood. We both live in the Los Angeles area, and as you mentioned, being a believer in such a secular environment can present interesting yeah. um, opportunities, and also, I mean, on the other side of things, it can be difficult at times. Has and especially you here. You are this known, world famous writer, yeah. um, and then you come to faith in Yeshua. How has that affected, or has it affected your work in Hollywood? It's it's made it harder. I mean, you know, it, it's it's certainly. I mean, I'm not somebody who believes necessarily in writing Christian fiction. Like yeah. everything has to be like clean now and bright, has to be about and everything's Jesus going to be great. And, yeah. yeah, and all that stuff. I don't. I'm, I'm a hard boiled writer. I'm a tough guy writer. I write about gangsters. I write about the, you know yeah. the, the seamy side of life. Um, <laughs> So in that way, it hasn't been bad. But there are certain things. It's very hard, as you know, to work in Hollywood. It, very tough. Yeah. And when there's certain things you won't do, it becomes even harder. Um, in reading your story, you had a stunning epiphany that convinced you that God was real. Yes. Talk about that, because that is just Well, well here's the funny thing. So I began to pray every day. And my prayers got longer. I didn't even know how to pray. I made it up. You know, I started making things up. You're like, like, I'm a writer. I got yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, do, do you have to say, <laughs> does there have to be rituals? Do I have to ask for only, can I only yeah. ask for good things? Can I ask for a new car? You know, what, you know what's, what's, how do you do right. this? Five years go by of praying. And five years, good and bad things happen, as you know. Yeah. And I noticed that after five years, my life has been transformed yeah. in the sense that I have what I used, what I called the joy of my joy, which was that even when I was unhappy, even in periods of grief, I, I loved life. I loved being alive. And it was like when you watch yeah. a movie and the scene is sad, but you still love the yeah. movie and you're crying, but you love the movie. Yeah. Suddenly I had that, and I realized it was because of this connection with God. And at that point I had moved to California. I was driving up in the Santa Barbara Hills and I was praying in my car because in California you have to do everything in your car. And I said to God, you've transformed my life. I'm so grateful. And I, 
there's nothing I can do for you. What can I do for you? Because you're God and I'm just this schmo, yeah. you know? <laughs> and, and instantly, as if a voice had spoken, it wasn't a voice speaking, but it was as it, it was, a, I heard, now you should be baptized. And I burst out out loud, you got to be kidding me. You know, I got to be. Like, I didn't even you know, say I believed in this. You know? I'm just praying. Because <laughs> I had left all that behind. That was yeah. part of my crazy life. Right. And I didn't want to go back and I didn't want to know it. Uh -huh. My father, who I I'd made a separate, my father and I were never close, but we'd made a separate piece. I thought, this is going to yeah. blow that. He'll, he said he would disown me. You know, I didn't really mind being disowned at that point, but I still, you know, yeah, I didn't want to bring trouble into wow. my own house. I knew it would give me problems in Hollywood. I had a big uh, screenwriting career going at that point, too. And I thought, this can't be right. And so I spent five months going over every aspect of my life. And that's where this book came from. Going over every aspect of my life to make sure I had If you were going to get baptized, it was going to be the right thing. <laughs> right. right. Well, I, I just love how, you're, I mean, in your story, you literally prayed yourself into faith in God. And yes. I, I've, I've never heard anything like that. I've huh. never met anyone who has, that has been how they came to belief in God, and, and you kept saying the joy, it was the joy. And yes. I mean, as we all know now, I mean, clearly it was the joy of the Lord that was infusing your life. And the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. It was becoming your strength, your strength even though you didn't know it was. That's, that, that's right. And that's so, and it just shows such a testament to the power of prayer. And I, I'm telling you, if you have not picked up this book, I just urge you to do it. It's absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, yeah, so Yes, well, we have an amazing show coming up for you next week. Here's a little sneak peek. The world-famous Messianic musician and my father-in-law, Paul Wilbur. Okay, <laughs> this is good. This is really good. So I remember so vividly, I was literally cleaning the house. This is where our personal relationship needs to stop right now <laughs> yeah. on camera. Yeshua is calling you now. You know, it's no accident you're here with us watching this show today. Now is your time to ask God to just take over your life. As you just heard from Andrew's incredible story, God loves you and is waiting for you to just accept that unconditional love and meet you right where you're at. Remember, if you have prayer needs, we're here for you. Just log on to our website, jvmi.tv. God loves you and so do we. I'd like to thank you, Andrew, again, Andrew Clavin, for being here, for spending time with us. Until next time, I'm Shay Wilbur for Jonathan Burness, saying shalom and God bless. Join Jewish Voice Ministries as we tour the Holy Land and celebrate Israel 2017. It's time to honor the 50-year anniversaries of Jewish Voice and the liberation of Jerusalem. On this trip, you'll stay in four-star accommodations as we tour Mount Carmel, Nazareth, Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives, Upper Room, and more. You'll see Jonathan Burnus commemorate the recapture of Jerusalem right where it happened. We'll also visit an Israeli military base and enjoy a Bedouin meal. You can renew your marriage vows on the Sea of Galilee and participate in an immersion ceremony at the Jordan River. As an added bonus, you can even visit Eilat, the Red Sea, and world-famous Petra. Act now before this once-in-a-lifetime event sells out. Call and speak with our events coordinator to learn more exciting details about Celebrate Israel 2017 or visit jvmi.org slash Israel.